Our co-host this morning, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Billy. And Rob, who do I lodge a complaint with? You said, have a donut. We have 10 minutes sure. to go. I was halfway through the donut. You said, put those earphones on because we're going right I now. I know. I was yeah. chewing. Yeah. I thought, oh my gosh, I got to go. Well, you know, here's the thing. Uh, I can I can have guests bring in food, but I, I can't control when and how fast you eat that food. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm just saying the amount of time that we have to do the uh, to the eating part is where I had some questions. Bill it, and I still have half a donut yeah, here, so we yeah. didn't have enough time. So you need a stronger union. You need a better <laughs> co-host union. Is the problem here? Your, your your union is weak. Yeah, yeah. One who we could get to I join don't us in the union. I, I don't, don't think Gil Scrap would. No, probably and, not. Uh, uh, Bodwell will not. No. Matt Miller might. He might be a good union member. He he may or he may not. I how, don't know. How about the Badger? You think the Badger would join? No, Badger's not going to be a union guy. <laughs> but it's, it's really about the donut eating. So I don't know that we need to be that. You know, I could ask that extensive. our next guest, the State Democratic Party okay. Chairman, Mike Pushkin. Mike, good morning to you. Good morning. I was enjoying the conversation. <laughs> I think y'all should definitely organize. And, uh, you should have some time to eat donuts. This is we, I'm with you. This is the reason why I brought you on is because I thought you might be sympathetic <laughs> to the cause here. Yeah. yeah, I'm with you. I apparently am abusing I'm, my I'm co-host. On the phone and I don't get to eat a donut, but that's okay. Uh, we'll mail you one. I can't guarantee what shape If you were be here in person, Mike, we have a dozen. Well, we yeah. have ten now, yeah. so and not Mike, a dozen. Rob has been very skilled to intimidate all the guests to bring in food. Yes. <laughs> so, so we have a whole back room full of food. Brownies, donuts, uh, uh, probably cheesecake from a guest uh, several months ago. It's, uh, it's, <laughs> I hope <laughs> it's not still there several months, Bill. <laughs> Well, I'll have to come up and, and, and join you in person. Sometime. Indeed. With treats, though, Mike. With treats. <laughs> That's a qualification there. <laughs> Mike, do you live in Charleston? I do. I live on the west side of Charleston. Yeah, what, what do you do when the legislature is not in session? Well, I work for a, uh, a direct care provider uh, for uh, individuals who have intellectual and developmental disabilities. Uh, I don't work with the clients. I, I'm more like an internal reviewer, auditor, mm-hmm. uh, if you will. Uh, yeah, that's the company I work for, and I'm also I'm the chair of the uh, second largest political party in the state of West Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great response. It takes a little bit of time, doesn't what, it, Mike? What, that, what takes, does... that takes a lot of time. Yeah. I mean, what... man, I, I think it's easier to be on the winning end these days. It's easier when you have a uh, you know huge staff and you're able to uh, you know take in all those. Uh, all those millions of dollars in contributions for people who want access and power. It's harder being the underdog. So, yeah, I got my work. We got our work cut out for us here. Bill, you, you've been chomping at the bit to say something there. <laughs> yeah, a couple of things. I want to get to candidates in just a uh, couple of minutes. But uh, during this session, uh, Mike, uh, you were quoted as saying this was a do do nothing uh, session, legislative session. Uh, do you still feel that way? Absolutely. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, one of my colleagues, the minority whip, uh, Sean Bluehardy, I think he was on a statewide radio show and summed it up pretty well where he felt that and he, he and I have both been there, uh, been in office for, for 10 years now, as well as Speaker Hanshaw. We, came, we all came in in, in 2014. And uh, Sean said it was the slowest and dumbest session he's ever <laughs> taken part in. And I would have to agree with that. We spent so much time uh, talking about these culture war issues that, that, that they like to bring up during election years. Uh, it gets people mad at each other, fearful of each other. It's, it's it meant to divide. We spent so much time talking about those issues, and, and most of those bills, uh, thankfully, didn't even pass. But the problem is we spent so much time talking about these you know, do-nothing culture war uh, issues that we didn't spend enough time on the actual issues that West Virginians need us to, to take up, whether it's uh, access to child care, uh, whether it's addressing the foster care crisis, uh, you know, substance use uh, 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 crisis in this state. So many real issues that West Virginians need, needed us to take up, and, um, and we didn't do that. And then at the last minute, we had this amendment to the budget dropped on us. Uh, which now that uh, and I didn't vote for it, I think it was a record number of no votes on the budget on the last night. And if you look at it closely, you see why we're, we're just now seeing how massive the cuts to Medicaid are uh, in that budget amendment. So um, which is now you know, which is currently the budget. 
But, uh, Mike, isn't there a tendency to, for a lot of bills to be introduced with little or no expectation of passing? I don't think this was uh, typical of just this this session, but doesn't it go back through in time? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, because, of, yeah, it's something that happens. Yeah, every year there's way more bills that are introduced, obviously, than, than passed. But I think this year we spent more time than ever talking about bills that were never going to pass. And uh, just you know, just the election year rhetoric, and, and the problem is now more than ever, uh, West Virginia really needed us uh, to roll up our sleeves and get to work, and we just didn't do that. Not from where I was sitting. That's not what I saw. I saw a lot of time wasted. I think there was a I can't remember who said this, but it's a pretty good quote. It's, you know, when it's all said and done, a whole lot more got said than ever got done. That's how I would sum up this session. So Mike, I can tell you the good things that came out of this session. I'm sorry. This okay, was, no, go I ahead. Could, I, I could. It would be very short. And if you just want to talk about the good things that came out of this session, it would be a very short interview. And we finally eliminated, or, or moving towards eliminating, the uh, yeah, income tax on on our social security on social security benefits for seniors. That's a good thing. That's something that we've been trying to do for a long time. And, and also, we got through pay raises for public employees, including teachers. I don't think it's nearly enough to offset. Are the PEIA increases to make an actual pay raise. It's more of just a, uh, uh, you know, just evening out of it, uh, and that's about it. That's just about it. So, well, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. What was your what were no? You my say? my question was, I was sort of going in a different direction. So, um, you're talking about some of the, you know, some of the social issues that came up. What about? I mean, do you sense? You've been around for a long time. Certainly, the Democrats were in power for um, many, many years. And and now I think what we're seeing is some either divisiveness or splintering of the Republican Party. I mean, do you agree that that's happening? That, I mean, obviously here, um, all of the all of the um, opposition, all of the races in the primary are um, are on the Republican side. Is there a, a bigger divisiveness there after a couple years of Republicans being in power? Can you talk about that? Well, I, yeah, I think when with with the with the supermajority comes uh, supermajority problems, and uh, they have to uh, deal with several different, not just two facts, several different factions. Uh, on the other side, and of course, you know we're much smaller in num- numbers, unfortunately, and, and we, we are more united than ever. And we we don't we don't uh, require our members to march in lockstep. We can have differences of opinion, but there's certain basic principles that, that our side that we stand for and won't back away from. And uh, you see, on on the Republican side, you have you know those who. Uh, who have their you know allegiance to the chamber? You have those that uh, would uh, are more populist, and and, uh, and then you have those that uh, you know, want to be guided more by their uh, by their religious beliefs. Uh, um, so yeah, there's I'd say there's several factions on the Republican side, and it's it's interesting to watch that play out. Yeah, watching it play out, Mike. Uh, uh, for the general, you have a. A uh, good candidate, uh, Steve Williams, running for the governor. Also, Glenn Elliott running for the U.S. Senate. Uh, both uh, are are Republicans. Uh, excuse me, both are Democrats, and they're both have I was been. About uh, to say. Yeah, and <laughs> you, you didn't get that memo yet, did you, Mike? They already switched. Sorry. Sorry. Dog on it. Yeah, no, on. they are very much uh, Democrat. Democrats. Yeah. You're right. We and, have we have great candidates up and down the ballot, and, and you know the two that you mentioned happen to have track records. Uh, in the executive branch, are they running uh, you know, the, the city of Huntington, the city of Wheeling? Uh, you know, Steve Williams has an excellent story to tell. When he when he became mayor, he's first of all he's the only uh, three term mayor in the history of Huntington. Uh, they have uh, term limits there. Three is is it? He's termed out. He was the only mayor in the history of that city to have been elected three times. It's because of the job that he's done. And uh, I don't know if you know the shape that Huntington was in when Steve Williams was first elected. Uh, but they they didn't have enough uh, cops on the beat. They couldn't afford to pay their first responders. They were in a financial crisis, and and you know, the Williams administration has really turned that city around. And he can do the same for West Virginia. 
But it's going it's going to be a major uphill battle for a Democrat to be elected, uh, especially in a uh, presidential year. Uh, there's uh, admittedly uh, it's not. Well, maybe highly contested, but probably the uh, Trump is going to win fairly convincingly in West Virginia. But how are you going to get your folks uh, with any sort of competitive arguments that might sway fo- uh, sway sway the voters? Well, I think if, if we look at the uh, the experience of the candidate, and we don't know who who uh, the Mayor Williams, who his opponent will be yet, but I think there's going to be a great uh, comparison there on on one that has real experience. And, you know, running one of the largest cities in the state and the success record that they've had there uh, against uh, those who just really want to uh, blow off hot air and, and and repeat, you know, empty political rhetoric. Uh, so, yeah, of course, it's going to be an uphill battle. I know what the political climate is in West Virginia right now, but we feel that we have the better candidates and of course the, 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 um, those on, the, on our side that actually have the experience to do the job. So we're going to fight as hard as we can, and we're going to get our message out there and uh, leave it to the voters. Mike Pushkin is our guest. He is the chairman of the West Virginia State Democratic Party, a delegate as well. Mike, how many years have you served at this time? Uh, This was my 10th year. 10th year. Believe it or not. Yeah, I came, uh, I was elected the year that the the legislature flipped. Came in in 20, I was elected in 2014, and uh, because that was the year that, uh, that the Republicans uh, got the majority. I think when it flipped, it went, I've what? Always, 50, I've always been in the minority. Was it 53, 47, 54, 46 when it flipped that first year? No, it was a, they had, there was a big, they had a big night that night. I think we lost 19 seats that night. So it was like, um, I believe it was 36, six, yeah, six, 36 yeah. Democrats. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so. Uh, and some of those Democrats in that 36 are no longer Democrats. Yes, yeah, some are Republicans yeah. now and some yeah. of them left. Completely. So tell me about this past session. What would you have liked to have seen passed that didn't pass? Uh, well, I think we should have could have done more to, uh, well, I know we could have done more to address uh, the foster care issue. Um, and, and that's, you know, there's several bills that were floating around to address. I think we really need to get to the root cause of it and find out, uh, you know, quit uh, uh, attempting to fix this around the edges and really get at the root causes of why so many families are winding up in this position to begin with. Uh, that could be an issue in how we prioritize our, our state budget. Um, also, one that, that the governor mentioned at the – well, several things the governor mentioned during the state of the state, and the speaker uh, mentioned that we were going to address also, it, is uh, ch- access to child care in the state. There were two different bills uh, that were moving, and neither of them uh, seemed to be a real priority of, of the supermajority. And I think it's because they have price tags attached to them. But this is a, a workforce issue. This is a – I mean, they passed that unemployment bill. If you want to get people back to work, you want to get people working, we need to address the shortage of child care in the state. So one was a tax credit to help offset the cost of the, you know, the, the affordability and the cost of child care. The other one addressed uh, accessibility because we have so many of these agencies closing up because they do their reimbursement-based uh, on enrollment rather than attendance. So there was a bill that passed through uh, the committee that I serve on, the House Committee on Health and Human Resources, that would have uh, you know, flipped the way the reimbursement rate goes based on attendance uh, rather than enrollment. You know, we're talking about toddlers, young children. Um, you know, sometimes they they get sick, they get taken on a vacation, so the attendance will fluctuate. But the but they're still they still have to. You know, keep these places open. So the the reimbursement should be based on the should be based on the enrollment. Did that That's get? One that should have run. I could go the, ahead. The daycare. I know the governor had mentioned it as well, and there we actually a couple of different Republicans had talked about daycare as being something that would be taken up child care specifically in this session. Did it get anywhere okay. well, in terms of momentum? It, it passed. Uh, it died in that bill. The one I was talking about about accessibility. Uh, they never put it on the agenda in House Finance because, unfortunately, you have uh, several people on the other side of the aisle uh, say this a lot, and I, I don't know where this quote came from, but it sums up a lot of the folks in the West Virginia legislature and in the governor's office. They, they know the cost of everything and the value of nothing, unfortunately, and uh, it's something that needs to be addressed. Uh, some of these uh, – you know, a lot of these bills that have price tags attached to them, those are the ones that die in finance. 
Uh, and if you look at the budget, you can see why, because they don't want to pay for anything. But if we're, if we're able, if we're going to actually grow the state and make this a place where people are going to, to attract investment, uh, more investment, uh, we, we have to address the child care issues. We have to address so many of these issues in the state. Sometimes we've got to we got to uh, uh, put some money towards that, but they're they're unwilling to do that. In fact, this budget that passed, uh, I think they're just now figuring out how much it actually cut Medicaid. I mean, we're looking at, I think, close to a billion dollar cut in Medicaid once you uh, factor in the matching funds. So we're really shooting ourselves in the foot when you cut a fund uh, that there's a three to one federal match on. You're just throwing money away, and those are for those are for important services that affects child care, that affects child care or foster care because uh, that's the, some of that money is towards the, the, the how we pay CBS workers. Uh, it affects um, you know the IDD waiver program. People in this state who are, are the most vulnerable, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their families who need help taking care of them. We we you know, slash that program. It, it, it's something that really needs to be addressed in the special session. Mike, let's go to strategy for a second. You've mentioned a couple of so times been in the minority uh, and it's difficult to get anything through. You also mentioned uh, committees such as finance committee. If there is a bill that you do not like, and we can go through four or five that probably falls in that category, do you have a strategy of how to derail that bill so it never really passes well, I think you look at all the bills that didn't pass and say, yeah, I think we had a pretty good strategy, didn't we? Okay, be specific. Uh, what uh, is there a universal <laughs> strategy? Do you work with the finance committee with fiscal notes or, or what? Well, I think the main thing, I mean, politics is all about what life really is all about, you know, personal relationships. And you can, we can have these conversations with our colleagues about why this bill is really harmful. Uh, sometimes that doesn't work. Some, believe it or not, sometimes you know region and logic does not rule the day at the West Virginia legislature, unfortunately. Uh, but there are other tactics. There's uh, you know any member of the uh, of the legislature of the House can ask for a bill to be read. Um, so that's that can slow the process down. And sometimes it's like at the last minute when they spring like an unemployment bill on you, you don't know what's in it. You have to ask for it to be read just so you know what's in it. Um, and the other thing we can do is, uh, you know, there's to make amendments. I think there was a uh, bill that we thought was very harmful. It changed the uh, the definition of the word uh, equal. Okay, and this was this quote unquote women's bill of rights did absolutely nothing for women, and it didn't grant anybody any rights. It actually took rights away. It redefined the word equal, and then applied that uh, to the Human Rights Act. An incredibly harmful bill. So when that bill came up on the last day, all of a sudden there were 32 amendments offered on that bill. And I will, uh, I'll credit my colleague Kayla Young with putting in the extra hours and coming in and drafting those amendments herself and entering those into the system. So on the last day, did they want to take up 32 amendments on a meaningless bill? Uh, no, so the bill didn't pass. So there was, there, there, there's plenty of strategy you can do to, even with the, with the small numbers to slow down bad bills. And I think, well, uh, the Democratic caucus was uh, in the House was uh, was very uh, we had some pretty good we had good strategy and it worked. You mentioned personality of working with uh, colleagues can probably work both ways. Uh, from us in the Eastern Panhandle, just uh, getting news clips, there is an impression that I have anyway that uh, there was some. Um, uh, that between the uh, the Education Committee on the Senate with uh, uh, Senator Grady and the Education Committee on the House, there was some unhappiness the way things were being done. So there was a deliberate attempt to keep some of Senator Grady's bills from passing. Any truth to that? There's always, unfortunately, that's how they that's how they work. A lot of them. I mean, I, I was at an event the other day with uh, the chairman, the Senate Finance Chair. Uh, Senator Tarr, where he was talking about he, a bill died, a very a, a important bill about funding for Potomac State University. That he didn't run the bill because they didn't run one of his bills in the House. And, you know, unfortunately, that's the reality, but it shouldn't be. Now, you and I don't read, or the last thing that I read when I read a bill, the last thing that I read are the names at the top of it. We should be voting you know, in a perfect world. We should be voting based on the merit of the idea if it's going to help improve the lives of West Virginians, if it's a good bill, if it's a good piece of legislation that's needed, and be less concerned about whose bill it is. I'm so tired of hearing this, the, the pettiness uh, from the other side uh, when it comes to this. And I heard the interviews with the, 
with the education Senate education chair, uh, Amy Grady, where she said, well, threatened to not run any House bills next year because she didn't get her way. It's it it it, it comes off as childish and petty, in my opinion. Should her bill and, have and passed, Mike? We, no, no, what? it shouldn't have. It was a bad bill. I, I believe we need to address these discipline issues, but we need to take a, a deeper look at it, see why uh, children are, are, are acting in, the, in this way and, and what's the, you know, it's a, it's a much larger issue than just saying, well, we're just going to kick you out of school with absolutely no resources to take care of you. I mean, we want to lose another generation of West Virginians, then you know, look at that bill. Well, is keeping them in the classroom helping the 19 out of the 20 who are behaving, though? Uh, no, we need to address the issue. But she was unwilling to move on some of the things in that bill that a lot of us felt that was just too severe. And, you know, Randall, we already passed a, this, a discipline bill for the older kids, for high school kids. This was about kindergarten through sixth grade. Yes. There's little kids. And it said if they couldn't, uh, they, were, they weren't allowed to, if they're kicked out, they can't ride on the bus, no matter what they were getting kicked out for. Okay, couldn't ride on the bus. And if their parents, uh, were some, for some reason, were unable to pick them up, then the law enforcement was called, and that they were going to get a ride home in the back of a police car. I, I thought that was very extreme to you know, introduce kindergartners into the criminal justice system because they were uh, a discipline problem at school, no matter what the offense was. So, no, it was a bad bill. It shouldn't have passed. Was the, was the framework of the bill, at least the spirit of it, something that we could work with to improve these situations in the classroom where the, the teachers need a little bit of relief from these kids who are just not allowing other kids in the classroom to learn? There was a House version of the bill that was far less severe. Uh, the education chair in the Senate was unwilling to make any compromises from what I, from what I saw. About a minute left, Maria. You had a question. Uh, just real quick, do you uh, do you think that Governor Justice should veto um, that childhood vaccine bill, even as streamlined as it was? Um, yes. <laughs> Short answer: I think that he should veto that bill. I don't want to see any weakening of our public health laws in West Virginia. You know, West Virginia has one. That's one thing that we've done right. One thing that other states have looked to us. Uh, too. You know, when, you, when you see that some of the surrounding states have seen the resurgence of, of measles, uh, you see, even in some states you're seeing a resurgence of polio. You're not hearing about that here because we have fairly strong uh, uh, laws in regards to public health. I don't want to see us weaken that. Now, do I think he will sign it? I think it's likely that by the end of the day he takes no action at all uh, as a, a profile and courage there and lets it go into law without his signature. And I think if this wasn't an election year and if he wasn't in a Republican primary against uh, an opponent to the right, he, he would be more likely to veto it. But I think what's influencing the governor's actions is his, uh, his uh, desire for his next office and not actually showing up at the office that he's supposed to be showing up <laughs> to right now. Uh, you know, he vetoed a bill yesterday that made the veto made absolutely no sense. It was back in 2020. We allowed for a certain amount of uh, renewable energy for, for our utilities to attract businesses that require that. And that's why – and it had – it wouldn't hurt uh, the coal industry one iota. And this was to simply expand that and remove the sunset, the bill that he vetoed, and then raise the megawatts to something like 200 megawatts, which isn't, isn't – it's not going to hurt any industry. Okay, what it's going to do is help industries move here. It's going to create jobs and create um, – you know, an uh, investment in our state. Uh, yet, you know, the governor vetoed it uh, because he's he's in a primary election and he's he's got an opponent to the right. And, and that was why a, he vetoed it. it. Was a, what's that? And that was a Republican bill that was supported by yes, a large was. sector of the energy sector. Yes, it was. It was supported by the energy sector. I believe that veto will lead to us having even higher uh, uh, electric bills. Uh, higher price, higher rates. And West Virginia, unfortunately, has some of the highest utility rates uh, in the nation. Can and you... uh, and this isn't going to help it. I mean, to me, it's not it's not conservative to be uh, to this protectionism and picking winners and losers. And that's what the governor's doing. Can you... And there's absolutely nothing conservative about it. There's nothing free market about that. Mike, can you square up the governor's veto of this bill contrasted with the governor's support of Form Energy? Uh, no, I think it's very hypocritical. I don't understand why I can't under, you know, understand for the life of me why he vetoed that bill. 
Uh, I think that bill would have uh, actually helped us uh, you know, bring businesses to this state. I don't understand why he vetoed the uh, you know the two million dollars for uh, WVU Medicine to for the research of um, Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's. That was just inexplicable why he would veto that. So I don't know why the governor's doing what he's doing. I know the people act strange uh, when they're more concerned about their next office instead of the one they're currently in. Mike, thanks so much for your time this morning. Greatly appreciated. Hey, thanks for having me on. Good to talk to you. Thanks. Delegate Maybe Mike Pushkin. Hey, we will. I'll send you one in the mail. Uh, Delegate <laughs> Mike Pushkin. He is the state Democratic Party chair, or as he said, the second largest party in the state of West Virginia <laughs> as well earlier in the interview.